Celebration Choir for this beautiful song. I hope that each and every one of you are making plans to be here tonight for our Hanging of the Greens. If you know what that means, raise your hand. Good. The rest of you come out and learn what it means that when we hang the greens. Uh, these folks will be singing many more beautiful songs. You don't want to miss it. So be back tonight at 6.30. And um, you may uh, notice yet again this week there is a conspicuous uh, spot missing on our second pew right here. And I have the uh, sad um, privilege of, of informing those of you that don't already know that Buck Spivey is worshiping the Lord in the presence of the Lord in heaven this morning, right now. And about 8 o'clock this morning, he drifted off into eternity. So let's be lifting up Virginia and Carl and Fred and all of the uh, family who are uh, very confident and, 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 and joyous, yet at the same time grieving uh, a very, very difficult experience. And most likely the service will be here on Wednesday, so make plans for that. Now, let me ask you this question. Who is Lottie Moon? I guarantee someone or two or three people are in this building this morning. Maybe they didn't grow up with the tradition, and you're wondering, what is all this Lottie Moon business? Um, I hear she's going to be here at Kingsland Baptist Church, so keep your eye out for her. Some of you may be wondering, did we loan money from her? When are we ever going to pay her back? Every year they want more money for Lottie Moon. Um, several years ago when I was in Bible college, I, I uh, studied the foundations of missions and did a 10-page paper, Lottie Moon. And for some reason, I, I guess I didn't put it onto a disc because I couldn't find it this week, but we did find some information to include on your bulletin. And I hope you'll look at that. I hope you'll read it. Um, also, on the inside of your bulletin, um, we are having uh, nationally the, the Week of Prayer for International Missions. I hope you got one of these. We handed them out just the other week. I'm sure there's more in the back there. But in case you didn't, uh, every day of the week inside of your bulletin, there's a different missionary, a different effort that we are praying for. And we know that nothing is as, as valuable or as powerful as prayer. Prayer makes all the difference in the world. And prayer is what causes God's people to move and to commit to full-time missions and to become career missionaries or two-year missionaries or short-term missionaries and for the rest of us to support it. Uh, Lottie Moon, the namesake of the International Missions Offering, has become something of a legend to us. But in her day, she was just another struggling missionary, a deep-loving Southern Baptist who labored tirelessly so her people group could know the love of Jesus. Her mission, well, when she set out um, for China, she was 32 years old. She had turned down a marriage proposal and, and left her job and her family to follow God's leading. For 39 years, Lottie Moon labored chiefly in the Tingchao and Pingtu uh, areas, China. People feared and rejected her, and some refused to listen to her. But some accepted her and accepted the gospel and accepted Christ. Her vision wasn't just for the people of China. It was for the whole world. It was for every day, for everyone. And like today's missionaries, she sent letters home asking for support, talking of the hunger and the struggle of the people in China, and um, asking for Southern Baptists specifically to give and to support and to pray. In 1912, during a time of war and famine, Lottie Moon um, slowly starved uh, with the people in China and uh, who didn't have enough food. Her fellow Christians saw the ultimate sign of love, giving her life for others. And on Christmas Eve, Lottie Moon died on a ship bound for the United States. And that is some of the connection of why we do this at Christmas and how it all ties together. Her legacy lives on, and today, when gifts aren't growing as quickly as the numbers of workers God is calling to the field, her call for sacrificial giving rings with more urgency than ever. And at this time, I'd like to just uh, run you through a short PowerPoint presentation of uh, what happened with our dollars last year. Uh, we gave last year. We give every week. 
at Kingsland Baptist Church, a portion of our offering every week goes to the cooperative program. And then a couple times a year we do at Christmas the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and then at Easter the Annie Armstrong offering at special times of focus. And uh, last year, 163 new people groups were engaged. Now, some of these uh, statistics I'm going to give you will be a little bit of review, and that's on purpose. We want you to get it in your, your, um, in your minds what's going on, how important it is. In 2004, over 607,000 people were baptized through the ministry of our international missionaries. And that has gone up and up every year. It'll be great to see what happened in 2005. Um, and it's great to know that great things are going to happen in 2006 because of what we're doing. Last year, over 21,000 new churches were started across the planet. Now listen, there is nothing, nothing like Southern Baptist missions. There's nothing that can hold a candle to it. There's nothing in the history of the world, there's never been anything on, on this scale that we play a small part in through our giving. 29,280 Southern Baptist volunteers served internationally last year. Now, that's not counting little mission trips around America or more locally. That is international mission trips. 692 uh, missionaries were appointed last year. I think that statistic has been mentioned already. 286 of them were career missionaries, long-term missionaries. That, that's their life. They'll stay with it till they die or till they retire. 396 of those were um, short-term missionaries, kind of like David and Beth from our church did a few years ago to Africa. Right now, there's around 52, 5,300, just international missionaries, not including the 5,000 North American missionaries serving. And as you can see on this next PowerPoint slide, $282 million were spent last year supporting them. Over half of that comes, 51% of that last year came from the Lottie Moon Christmas Hall, which drives home the importance of what we're doing right now. Half of our international missionary support comes right now. Last year, uh, the cooperative program, which we support week, week, week after week after week, um, received over $95 million to support the, the, um, the international missionaries. And the Lottie Moon money covered the rest. Last year, $133,286,221.58 came in for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And this year, our goal is $150 million. Our church's goal, our national goal is $150 million, And our church's goal is $25,000. And as far as I'm concerned, that is just pennies. We should do way more than that. And if we give sacrificially, we will do way more than that. If you would turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Let's talk this morning about investing in the kingdom. I believe that Buck Spivey was a man who spent his life, 89 years, investing into God's kingdom. And this morning, he's receiving his eternal reward. He's receiving for all those sacrifices, all those times where they did without, all those uh, dozens and dozens of Lottie Moon Christmas offerings where their family sacrificed, all that time he spent here at this church helping build the buildings and everything else. He invested in the kingdom. And you see, when we invest in God's kingdom, we always win. When we invest in God's kingdom, we always succeed. There's no such thing as a failure when you're investing in God's kingdom. I wonder if you've ever made a bad investment. I have. You know, you thought that car was so sharp, turned out to be a lemon. You thought that was the perfect home and the perfect location until the termites showed up. I don't know about you, but we were bombarded with ants a few, a month or two ago. Just ants everywhere in our new home. Very discouraging. And then ladybug season arrived. Now, ladybugs are cute, and they're, they're neat, and they flutter, and they're kind of romantic. When you get 20 or 30 of those things, it's kind of creepy. And they were everywhere. Did anybody else have a ladybug infestation? I'll never forget the look on my dad's face at eight, when I was 18 years old, and I pulled up in the new car I just bought, which was a 1979 Chevy Chevette. 
I was proud of myself. The floorboard was completely rusted out in that thing. It didn't matter to me. I just wouldn't press down real hard. That was a $400 investment, I thought, that turned out to be a bad investment. You see, when you invest in the kingdom, it's never going to be a Chevy Chevette. It's never going to turn out that way. It's never going to be a lemon. Ultimately, there's only one safe investment in all of the universe, and it's not gold, it's not oil, it's definitely not real estate, it's not even United States savings bonds. It's the kingdom of God. And when we invest in God's kingdom, we always, always win. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse number 10. This is the Apostle Paul writing back to the people in Philippi, writing from a jail cell, most likely in Rome. And he says, in verse 10 of Philippians chapter 4, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everything and all things I've learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek that the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, have received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. This passage talks about investing in the kingdom. It gives us the story of a, a group of needy people, a small church in Philippi who gave generously to support their missionary. The church at Philippi had sent Paul a generous love offering in his cup of joy overflowed. He was like one of our modern day missionaries who was so blessed to be supported by God's people week after week, month after month, year after year. Paul preached to the people in Philippi on his second missionary journey. Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica were three cities that are also called in, in, in the region of Macedonia. When you hear the word, the, the, the region of Macedonia in the New Testament, Philippi was in that area, in, in what is modern-day uh, Greece, northern Greece. They had sent aid to Paul. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, I was present with you, Corinthians, and in need, but I was a burden to no one. Why, how could he minister to the Corinthians and not be a burden? Well, for what was lacking to me, the brethren who came from Macedonia, the region that Philippi was in, supplied. They faithfully supported their missionaries as he spread the gospel. We can draw direct application from the passage that we've just read this morning that we must take advantage of giving opportunities. The people at Philippi did not hoard all of their resources. And as followers of Christ, it is a disgrace that in American culture, our mindset is let's hoard as much as we can so we can retire at like 40 and go to the lake and hang out for the rest of our lives and just sort of grow old and die. They didn't think that way. They were givers. We should be givers. We should take advantage of giving opportunities. A little girl once was given $2 by her daddy. And he said, put one in the offering plate tomorrow and the other, you can do whatever else you want with. She was pumped. She took her $2 and skipped down the street to the candy store. And on the way to the candy store, she tripped. A strong wind blew, and one of her dollars flew away down into a drain, a storm drain. It was gone. And she looked over, looked down at her dollar, looked at the drain, and said, I sure am sorry about your dollar, Lord. <laughs> Isn't that how we think sometimes? Me first, God second. Me first, God whenever I get to it, whenever it's convenient. I think we've all found out, those of us that give, and if you give generously, you know that it's never going to be convenient. And Kingdom Baptist Church needs to be a church full of men and women, members 
who take advantage of giving opportunities, just like the people in Philippi. Look at verse 11. Paul says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever said I am to be content. Now Paul emphasizes that his contentment is not determined by temporal or circumstances as far as life goes. Remember, he's writing this from a jail cell. Verse 12, I know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned those to be full and be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Regardless of his present circumstances, Paul was content. Now this is, this is the complete opposite and complete contradiction of how most of us think, how most Americans think. If I could just get my boy that little toy, if I could just get my girl that, that toy, they get a little bigger. If I could just get them that, that new Xbox thing, if I could just find one, man, they'd be so happy. And if we could just get a little bit more, if we could cram a little bit more into our homes, then we'd be content. If we could cram a little bit more into our lives. The Apostle Paul, that fantastic example, is writing from a jail cell saying, I'm content. I have everything I need. He had been beaten, stoned, suffered, shipwrecked. And he says, no matter how bad things get, I can make it. By the way, that's the context for that next wonderful, powerful verse. A verse that many, many of you have memorized. Philippians 4.13, what does it say? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Man, that's a wonderful verse, isn't it? I've quoted that verse my whole life. Here's the bad news. In context, Philippians 4.13 is telling us, I can do all things, meaning I can handle the most terrible circumstances. I can do without. I can be beaten. I can be shipwrecked. I can be left. I can be overlooked. I can be taken advantage of. All those bad things can happen. I can make it because of my relationship with Christ. He gives me strength to endure the hard times. Boy. That's not how I like to think of Philippians 4.13. I don't know about you. I like to think of the positive side, and there is a positive side. But we need to understand, God brought Paul through those terrible circumstances. These people gave out of their poverty to bless him, to prosper him. Why? Because their priorities were right. His priorities were right. Look at verse 14 with me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. By supporting him financially and prayerfully, these, these men and women were partnering with the Apostle Paul and his ministry. They were taking part. They were, they were part of the team. They supported his outreach to the people in Corinth and Thessalonica. They partnered with him to spread the gospel throughout the world. And in verse 17, we see that this isn't, this isn't just so Paul could, could be rewarded. We see that, look, look at verse 17. Or excuse me. Verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you did send aid once and again for my necessities. And then in verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds on your account. You're the ones who are blessed. You're the ones who, are, who, who make out. See, his friends from Philippi were often the only ones supporting him. Imagine if someone from our church became a missionary and we were the only ones supporting him. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? If that happened, we would never want them to do without, would we? Well, it's no different. In, in the big picture, these people are our responsibility. Turn over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's, let's read specifically about what the Apostle Paul is talking about in verse 15 and 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. They gave sacrificially. They supported his outreach to these people. They didn't just give. They gave out of their poverty. Look at verse number 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift. 
in the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we'd hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And isn't there truth in that? When you give your heart to Christ, when you, when you put his priorities first, when you seek first the kingdom of God, when you make that the priority of your life, it's no problem. It's all his anyway, isn't it? We realize 10% isn't God. It's not 10 All of it's God's. We tithe 10%. But every bit of it, 100% of it, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 17, the NIV puts it this way. I'm, look, I'm looking forward for what may be credited to your account. Isn't that great? When we give, God credits that to our account. And the investment value of the Philippians' gift was not primarily what Paul received, but the spiritual dividends they received. God is a good bookkeeper. He will settle all accounts, and he pays big dividends. We must never forget that. So by way of application to those verses, we should expect God to richly bless our generous spirit. Well, we have a generous spirit, and it's not just financial. It's the way you interact with people. It's the way you treat your spouse. It's the way you treat your kids. It's how you behave in the workplace. It's how you live your life. When you've given your heart to Christ and you love him and you want to serve him, you're his ambassador, you should expect God to richly bless that generous spirit. And you're going to have a generous spirit. You're going to want to give. There's a direct relationship between our level of giving and God's level of provision in our lives. When we give, God gives us more so we can give more. We don't give to get. That would be the wrong motive, wouldn't it? But when we give, we get so that we can give more. It's it's circular. And the more we give, the more God gives us. It's been said so many times, you can't outgive God, can you? Story told of a philanthropist who was asked, how is it that you give away so much and yet have so much left? The philanthropist responded, I suppose it's like this. I shovel out and God shovels in. But God shovels way bigger. That's the Christian life. That's the life of abundance. That's the life of the person who's Holy Spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-led, that has a generous spirit with the way he uses his mouth, with what he listens to, with what he looks at, with how, what he does with his hands, with how you help your neighbor, while you, how you help your fellow church member, your Sunday school class mate, and what we do with our money. And in verse 18, we see this word, sacrifice. Look at verse 18 again. Indeed, I have all in abound. I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. A sweet smelling aroma. An acceptable, say it out loud with me, sacrifice. Let's do that again. An acceptable sacrifice. Well-pleasing to God. Now, the Old Testament background is the sacrifice, not of atonement, but of thanksgiving and praise. This was a sacrifice of praise, and this is pleasing to God. Our giving is a barometer of our spiritual condition. How much do you love your Savior? Do you care about the lost in, in, our, in, our, in our city? Do you care about the lost in our, in our state, in our world? Internationally speaking, all throughout the world, do you care? Do you care that people grow, grow up, live to be old, 80, 90, maybe 100 years old, and never once heard the gospel, not one time. Does that matter to you? It should. What are you willing to sacrifice? You see, the love of God constrains us. Our love for our Savior should compel us to do something. And while one can give without loving, that's possible, there's no way to love without giving. And we should be givers. We should be giving sacrificially. And the application to this whole thing is we should be giving regularly and we should be giving sacrificially. How are you sacrificing for the kingdom of God? Ask yourself that question this morning. How are you personally sacrificing? When was the last time someone made fun of you because you tried to share the gospel with them or you prayed before your meal? One of my Christian brothers told me recently, he said, I started praying for my food at work. And I was so afraid people were looking at me. And they weren't. He peeked. None of them were looking. They could care less. People don't care. They might even respect you for it. Or they might make fun of you. They might tease you. When was the last time you, you suffered some level of persecution for standing for your Christian principles, sacrificing for Christ? 
sacrificing for the kingdom. What level of, 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 of giving would be a sacrifice for you? Think about that. You know, for some of us, to put in $5, and I'm thinking more of this region of the room, to put $5 in the plate would be a sacrifice. Well, to get well, one red cent out of them is a sacrifice. I can tell you, it's very difficult sometimes. $100, is that a sacrifice? Would $1,000 be a sacrifice? To, to know that little boys and girls, men and women who have never heard are going to hear the gospel? What would be a sacrifice for you? What would be a sacrifice to me may not be a sacrifice to you. We should give regularly and sacrificially, and the result of that is that God notices your sacrifice for his kingdom, and he will respond by meeting your every need. Look at verse 19. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That's the context of that verse. Two very famous verses we've looked at this morning. They don't usually get presented that way, though, do they? God's going to take care of your needs. I mean, that's a true that's a true fact for the believer. But you know what? There is a relationship to your generous spirit, your giving spirit, and God meeting your needs. So this, this question this morning is, are you investing in the kingdom? Do you understand that when you invest in the kingdom, you never lose? It's a 100% gain. The, the stock, the, that mutual fund is going up, up, up every year. It's never gone down. The Philippians met Paul's need out of their poverty. God met their need out of his riches. He is always faithful. God's supply is infinite, abundant, inexhaustible, limitless, and boundless. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God can and will meet our needs as we meet the needs of servants around the world. God will bless you. And I left my little book down here on the front pew. I want to share with you in closing this morning the story of a missionary couple who sacrificed it all. This is a great book. Sharon Mann on the front pew here helped put this book together. She's credited in the, in the first the little opening part of it. This is the story of some Southern Baptist missionaries who sacrificed everything. It's called Lives Given, Not Taken. 21st century Southern Baptist martyrs. Let me tell you real quick about Larry and Jean Elliott. No, 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 it can't be true. Please, dear God, don't let it be true. Such was the anguished reaction from hundreds of friends, colleagues, and family members of Larry and Jean Elliott when the news began to spread on that terrible day of March 15, 2004. After only 23 days in Iraq, Larry and Jean had been shot by an anonymous gunman while driving on a highway near the city of Mosul. The Elliots and a Southern Baptist co-worker had died instantly in the attack. I believe that Southern Baptist co-worker, his spouse, spoke at the SBCV meeting just a few weeks ago about their experience. Two others were critically wounded. One of them also would eventually die. How could this happen? How could the Elliott service to so many for so long be cut off with such sudden cruelty? How could life go on without Larry's room-shaking laugh, Gene's gentle smile, and the commitment, the love, the sheer joy they brought to each other to each day in relationship? Family and church friends in North Carolina had concerns about the Iraq assignment, as would we, and had expressed to them, to Larry and Jean, months before the veteran missionary couple left for the region. Larry's unvarnished response was this. Yes, we could get killed. He knew what he was getting into. But he repeatedly reminded them, everyone of the, the Apostle Paul's words about a believer's mortality. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. He and Jean expressed a strong sense of God's call to the hurting people of a broken land and a strong confidence in God's provision. Their reassurance provided a measure of comfort to those left behind in the dark days after their deaths. But the pain still cut night deep in the hearts of their children, their brothers, their sisters, and their countless friends in multiple countries. Charlotte Observer columnist Joe DePriest, a friend of Jean's from high school days, admitted to having a hard time understanding Elliot's radical move. He had written about them for the local newspaper in Shelby, North Carolina, many years before. They gave up a nice house, and Larry left a good job to move to Honduras, one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. When DePriest asked why they were going, their reply echoed other missionaries he had interviewed. They had a call, and they couldn't run from it. But that was long ago. Why go to Iraq amid the deadly chaos of terrorism in the twilight of a long uh, and fruitful ministry? Missionary zeal is one thing, DePriest wrote, but Larry, who was 60, and Jean, 58, had two sons, a daughter, and nine grandchildren. From all reports, they were doing good work in Central America. They could have even retired. Why at their age, why would they put themselves in the middle of a shooting war? They were good people who wanted to help others, he concluded. 
But that doesn't adequately explain the LA's decision, which seems irrational to many reasonable people. God's logic follows his paths, not our limited fearful pace. He calls us to trust and obey whether or not we understand. If we say yes, he gives us peace beyond understanding. Larry and Jean spent their whole lives saying yes to him, observes their daughter Gina. And seeing where he led them, I can't argue with God. When you think of your level of sacrifice for the kingdom, when you think over the course of your life what you've invested into the kingdom, this morning I would just like to challenge you to rethink it, to re review your life, to take a good hard look at what you're doing. According to the Great Commission, we're all called to go. We started our service with that this morning and we're ending it with it right now. We are all called to go. We have all been commissioned. If you can't go physically, pray for those who can go. If you can go physically, go, whether it's on a local, national, or international trip. Go. If God calls you to full-time career service, surrender and go. Wouldn't that be great if God, in, in the year 2005, the year he took Buck Spivey home, replaced him with a missionary couple right here in our church to go out and, and, and fulfill the Great Commission for us to support. If God doesn't call you to full-time career service, Give sacrificially to support those who are going in your place. We're all called to go. How do you do this? How do you invest in the kingdom? Pray, give, and go. It's very simple. It's very simple. Now, this morning, before we have our time of invitation, it needs to be said, God made the ultimate sacrifice by offering himself for our salvation, didn't he? You may need to receive the free gift of salvation paid by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you're unsure of your eternal destiny. And all of this giving and all of this sacrificing, you know, let me tell you something. You invite Christ into your life, not only do you have something to die for, you have something to live for. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Christ this morning and you're here and you're doubting it, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what your background is, how financially secure you are, one day you're going to meet Jesus, and you're going to have to give an account for your life. And all that's going to matter, not your good deeds, not even how much money you gave the Lottie Moon and all that, what's going to matter chiefly, most importantly at that point, is do you have a relationship with Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? Today, if you're not 100% sure whether or not you have a relationship with Christ, Come forward. Let somebody pray with you. I'll pray with you. Show, show you from the Bible how you can have your sins forgiven, how you can have a relationship with Christ that will give you purpose, passion for living. And then watch out. Because that new Christian, that young believer, actually believes the Bible and actually believes, man, this is important. There are people all over the world that need, need Jesus. See, many of us long-term church members, many of us long-term Christians need to repent for selfishly holding on to our lives and resources instead of living a life of surrender and sacrifice. That's what it's all about. And it's Christmas. We all know it's more blessed to give than to receive. But do we live that out? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Today, will you just ask the Lord, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? And the answer is yes. You fill in the blank, Lord. Whatever you want from me. Wouldn't it be amazing wouldn't it just be absolutely astounding if a, a cute little gray-haired senior citizen or senior citizen couple announced to the church, God called us to be missionaries. We're going to replace Larry and Jean. They're gone. We're going. Wouldn't that be awesome? And then Larry and Jean's story basically was of a, of a younger couple who had a good business, had a good life, everything was going great. They gave it all up. I wonder if there may be a young couple in this, in this place this morning. Um, God's calling you to give it up, to surrender, to go. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be awesome? God is still calling people. What if there's a young person who God's knocking on your heart's door, and he has for so many? Wouldn't that be great? Is he allowed to do that? What is your heart's attitude? We're going to sing the invitation course, I surrender all today. Is that true? Are you willing to surrender everything? And as you surrender, really the, the little, the marbles that, that is your life that are, are very small, you give it to Jesus, and he turns it into so much. It's really no surrender at all, is it? 
when we surrender, the, the dividends, when we invest in the kingdom, what comes back is so much better, so far greater. Are you willing? Will you pray sincerely about God, what God wants you to do this year for our international missionaries? That's every single one of us. Every single one of us can give. Will you commit this morning to getting with your spouse this week? Don't put it off another day. Do it tonight. Do it today. And prayerfully considering, what are we going to do? What would be a sacrifice for us to give to Lottie Moon? It is serious. It is very, very serious. It is dead serious. Would you pray about these things during our time of invitation? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? In a spirit of prayer, I just ask that you would take a minute to do business with God. As the piano plays, I surrender all. What a wonderful song for this service. Are you taking the Great Commission seriously? I'd like to think that Kingsland Baptist Church is a Great Commission church. I know we are. But really, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And while there are many, many illustrations, all the way from joining a faith team to helping in the nursery, to telling your neighbor about Jesus, to passing out a track at the restaurant, to, to donating money to reach international missionaries, local missionaries. There's a thousand applications. The real question is, where's your heart? Do you possess that generous spirit? Do you have a sacrificial spirit to give till it hurts, to give and give and give, realizing that you have a short span of time on this planet? to make an impact on others. You're here today and you will be gone either tomorrow or a tomorrow. What are you going to do with your life? How are you going to invest into the kingdom? Because when you invest in the kingdom, you always win. You always succeed. You always prosper. Right now, I want to talk to that person who may be in our, in our presence. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to ask you this simple question. Do you have doubts? Are you unsure of your spiritual destiny? And I'm not going to really do a whole lot more than just ask that question. I do want to pray for you. I will not call you out or anything like that. But you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray for you because all this missionary talk is wonderful. But right now you've got problems. You've got spiritual problems. You're unsure of your eternal destiny. You're not 100% sure whether you're saved or not. And you're concerned enough for your soul to just raise your hand and say, boy, pray for me, Pat. Please pray for me. I have a spiritual need. I'm lost. I'm unsure of my eternal destiny. Would you raise your hand and I will pray for you? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You don't need to raise your hand again. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. You don't need to raise your hand again. Oh, God, I want to pray for these three that have admitted they're unsure of their eternal destiny. God, I pray that you'd give them the courage not to go another day uncertain about that. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage to walk the aisle this morning and have a man or a woman simply lead them to Christ, that they can have their sins forgiven, that they can profess faith in you today. Oh, God, I pray for our church that we would sing this song, maybe for some of us, for the first time with sincerity. I surrender all. My pocketbook, my, my calendar, my life, everything. My family, my future, it's all yours. Oh, God, help us to invest in your kingdom. And, Lord, I pray for those that need to do business with you today. I pray that you would work in their hearts and that they would surrender today. Would you stand with me during this time of invitation?